Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Earlier this year, a well-known Russian gay rights group called GayRussia.ru applied for permits to hold gay pride parades in the Russian Republic of Chechnya. The North Caucasus is known as being a particularly difficult place to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, but what followed came as a shock. Chechen authorities rounded up dozens of suspected gay men and in some cases tortured them into giving the names of gay acquaintances. The independent Russian newspaper Novaya Gazeta reported that in several cases the men were murdered, sometimes by their own families in so-called honor killings after their release. Now, combined with a 2013 law banning what President Vladimir Putin's government called, quote, homosexual propaganda, the Chechen crackdown seems to indicate that Russia is becoming increasingly homophobic, even as LGBT rights are being strengthened in many other countries. Now, in a few minutes, we'll hear from a group of people who have been tracking the fallout from what some have called a pogrom against gay men in Chechnya. But first, for a different angle on this issue, we're going to talk to Pasha Zalutsky. He's a comedian from neighboring Belarus who took the unusual step of acknowledging that he was gay on a popular Russian television show, uh, which translates to open mic. Pasha, welcome to Global Journalist. Hi, Jason. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Like, I had read reports that you are the first openly gay comedian in Russia. Is that really the case? Yes, that's correct. I uh, participated this year in this um, stand-up comedy competition on which I performed uh, as an openly gay comedian describing the trials and tribulations of uh, being gay in Russia and Belarus, you know. And some, so no, nobody had ever done this before then, entertainers, uh, other people, actors, actresses? Uh, to my knowledge, in the Russian entertainment industry, you know, on national television in prime time, there has not been anything like that before. Well, I haven't seen all of your acts, but in one of your routines that I did see, it seems like part of your, your shtick is sort of like joking about being a gay person in Russia, right. like jokes about being in a gay pride parade, but being on the inside of a tank during the parade, or how you can't say right. you're gay and continue rubbing your buddy's neck. I mean, mm -hmm. why, why do you think this kind of humor, why do you think it works right now? Uh, well, you know, I, I, humor always works. You know, I, I, I love what uh, the late... Uh, American comedian Joan Rivers used to say that if you can laugh about something, you can live with it, you know. So I think that when the audience sees me laughing about this, and when they, when they, when I make them laugh about this, uh, everybody just seems to uh, easen up and relax, you know. And uh, um, I was able to, I was able to reach their hearts. I think that's how I feel, you know. Well, we're going to take a listen right now to one of your routines on the show, Open Mic. And part of this is going to be in Russian for our listeners. We'll give you the translation afterwards. Whitney Houston, I will always love you. клипсах и на каблуках. Это должен был быть coming out, но это вызвало другую реакцию. Это вызвало реакцию пахан. Ну ты отжег, братан. Ты молодец. Okay, great. Maybe if you can just give us the translation for, to that, Pasha. Which is difficult to, to do when you're not on stage, you know, but basically what I was talking about, that people sometimes quite, quite, quite can't grasp, grasp the fact that I'm openly gay. Um, it goes back to high school. At my high school prom, I was performing Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You, wearing high heels and big earrings. And it was supposed to be a coming out of the closet moment, but instead it provoked the reaction, dude, you rocked, give us a five. Why aren't you in the Eurovision contest? So, <laughs> so I mean, do you think the the popularity of this act has to do with the idea that being gay, it's sort of like it's more acceptable for you for it to be sort of part of your stage presence as part of like your comedic routine than it would be in real life? Um, well, uh, comedy really protects me in a wonderful way because in comedy you can get away with murder, and if you're funny, the audience is more inclined to forgive to forgive whatever. You know, and uh, I, I feel quite protected by comedy in this way. If I weren't a comedian, I don't know how being openly gay would play out. Uh, but um, um, I am a comedian, an openly gay comedian, I, and I can see people really opening up to my comedy and, uh, you know, willing to listen. Because you get at this in some of your acts, like you actually say, like, how it's easier for you to sort of tell the audience that you're gay or to talk about being gay in front of an audience as part of your comedy routine than it would be to just, like, talk about it on the subway. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I believe that I started doing stand-up comedy because I wanted to set myself free in Belarus. I, uh, I wanted to live openly and I was looking for a way because I was really bugged by all those questions asked by all these neighbors and elderly women. Why are you not married? Where are the children? Where are the grandchildren? So I was kind of looking for a way to give everybody an answer once and for all. So, and in stand-up comedy, I'm afforded this wonderful opportunity, uh, and I get away with it. It's wonderful. I, it's, I am very, very privileged. Well, I mean, you can tell from watching the program that the judges like they're wearing their emotions on their sleeve and they're literally like the first time that you say that you're gay like they're just shocked like they're overwhelmed by this news um but you so it's clear like you're crossing over a wall that is uh, is taboo i mean do you feel like do you feel like you know where the line is as to what you can and can't say like what sorts of jokes are acceptable what sorts of jokes aren't like could you make a joke about President Putin with his shirt off or something like that? Right. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, I think that I got to be I, I got to go easy on the audiences in the sense that um, uh, I, I feel that uh, uh, they are giving me they're, they're giving me an incredible this incredible line of credit, so to say, by being willing to open up and listen to me. So I, I feel that if I press them too hard, you know, if I'm if I'm too much in their face, uh, I, I, they can easily get tense, you know. So so there is a line. There is a line that you have to that you have to uh, follow. Uh, I just hope uh, that over time, as they as they, as they get as they grow more and more accustomed to my comedy, I will be able to expand more and more. Um, uh, so, <laughs> so you think like maybe I, I, in like three years, five years from now, like this sort of comedy routine might not work. It might not be as funny. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I think that I should be developing as a comedian and in three to five years. I definitely should be coming up with more routines. I hope I'm not stuck in the same routine um, discussing, discussing this news that this guy is gay. I hope I will be progressing and expanding into in, in, into other areas. You know, if, if expanding the horizons. Well, great. Well, Pasha Zalewski, no, that makes total sense. Thanks so much for joining us on Global Journalist. Thank you very much, Jason. It's a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. You're listening to Global Journalist on today's program. We're talking about gay rights in Russia. We just heard from Pasha Zalewski, a gay comedian who has taken the unusual step of being open about his sexuality on Russian national television. Now, to expand our discussion, we're going to bring in three other people who have been following closely the issue of gay rights in Russia and the crackdown on gay men in the Republic of Chechnya earlier this year. Joining us from Moscow is Andrew Kramer, a longtime Russia correspondent for The New York Times. Also in Moscow is Tanya Lokshina. She's the Russia Program Officer for Human Rights Watch. We're also joined by a spokeswoman for the Russian LGBT network, a Russian gay rights group. She's asked that we not identify her by name or show her image on the video cast of this program. Thanks very much to all of you for joining us. Let me just start uh, with the spokesperson for the Russian LGBT network. If you could explain to our audience why you don't want your name used on this program or images of yourself uh, broadcast. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. So the problem is uh, that right now we're very much aware that we have to implement certain security protocols to be sure that we are safe because we had this discussion as a, as a team uh, because we're directly involved in relocating and evacuating gay men uh, from, from the Republic. And and are helping them to Sorry, find from the Republic of Chechnya. Of yeah, from the Republic of Chechnya, yes. And uh, for us to the to do this work, you know, we are kind of involved in a very high risk job right now. And we want to be safe to make sure that everyone else is safe. So we're trying not to disclose any personal information that might be harmful for our own safety, you know, because we are, you know, we're still trying to do our job as as best as we can. And we just heard from Pasha Zalitsky about being a gay comedian on Russian television. Just give us briefly your perspective on the challenges of being openly lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans in Russia. I mean, there are plenty of, there are definitely plenty of complications aside from 
the fact that our Russian discourse is highly homophobic and heterosexist in general, we're also talking about legislative our prohibition of, you know, the so-called anti-gay propaganda law that exists and that is a discriminatory legislation, you know, whatever the government is saying. And our, so these kind of borders that are set up for people to be able to express themselves, to be able to lead their lives as they want, to be able to have families, to be able to be open about their sexuality, to, you know, hold hands in public, you know, those basic things that in the West we think are, you know, common and widely shared here are mostly impossible. Well, Andrew Kramer, I wanted to go back to this itch issue of the roundup of gay men in Chechnya. You wrote about it earlier this year several times. Give us I gave just a little summary of this at the top of the show, but tell us a bit about what you learned in reporting that story. Certainly, and thank you for having me on the show. Um, I learned about this story from a, another publication, uh, Novaya Gazeta, a Russian newspaper. And I was reading their report, and oftentimes you'll read a story and be shocked by something that, that you see in the story. But in this case, I was shocked mostly by the denial. Um, there was a story about uh, police uh, law enforcement abuse, but the denial was even more chilling. And what had happened was um, uh, the newspaper had reported about uh, a, a roundup of gay men in Chechnya, uh, which is a very traditionally Islamic region um, and, um, and not tolerant of, of, uh, of gay uh, lifestyles. And then in, in, in response to this, in denying that this had happened, the regional authorities said that um, this is impossible because we have no gay men in our republic. Um, and, and this was really one of the more interesting and, and, um, and disturbing elements of the story. Um, what the original report said was... Um, so the denial uh, was this couldn't be a problem. We couldn't be doing this because gay men don't exist here. That's right. And then they went further and said, uh, this is a spokesperson for the uh, the regional leader, uh, went further and said that if we did have uh, any gay men, um, they wouldn't be with us for long because their families would kill them. So it was a very, uh, very harsh statement uh, by um, a spokesperson. Um, and uh, it wasn't a one-time uh, comment. Um, that he made this comment to Nova Gazeta, but also in, inter in an interview with me and in interviews with other reporters. Well, Tanya Lokshina, talk to us just a little bit about what has happened since, like, what, how did your group get involved in this? You've issued reports on what happened in Chechnya. Tell us just a little bit more about what you learned in that. Well, I've been working on Chechnya for many years, documenting human rights abuses there, first by Russian federal forces and then eventually by law enforcement and security agencies under de facto control of Ramzan Kadyrov the local strongman. Now, Ramzan Kadyrov has been running Chechnya for over a decade now, and with tacit blessing of the Kremlin, has instilled a tyranny there. He runs Chechnya through brutal repression. He runs it like his own fiefdom, his own private kingdom, in a sense. And Russian law does not apply in Chechnya, in practice, even even though officially Chechnya is just yet another region of the Russian Federation. The only law that is truly applicable in Chechnya is uh, Ramzan has said. That's how they describe it in the region, meaning that Ramzan Kadyrov goes on Chechen television, goes on his much famed Instagram account with about, what, two million users, two million followers. And then he says, this is what we do, this is what we don't do, this is how we are going to live from now on. And any act of disobedience or disagreement by a local resident is published, is punished promptly and ruthlessly. With uh, the anti-gay purge in Chechnya in particular, which made all the international headlines and which finally made the world pay attention to the horrid abuses in Chechnya for the first time in many years, the purge itself, on the one hand, it's something new 
because it's clearly unprecedented in its magnitude won dozens and dozens of months around the rock by security officials held in unofficial detention facilities and tortured on suspicion of being gay. At the same time, it's nothing new in a sense because the sort of methods that those security officials used to target gay people are the same methods that they've been using for years against other groups of undesirable. So, in other words, against that, other political dissidents or people who criticize the government issues right. like this. Uh, well, let, let me just stop you yeah, there because I want to. I want to move this. I had a question as well for uh, our spokesperson from the Russian LGBT network, which is involved, as you mentioned, in helping to evacuate, as you say, gay men from Chechnya to other parts of Russia, to other parts of the world. What are some of the stories that you've been hearing from these men? Our, I mean, I think we've wrote this, we've covered this in our report on our, on what's been happening in Chechnya, as well as the Human Rights Watch did. And our this is, I agree with Tanya, this is not something new in the sense that LGBT people and gay men were targeted years ago. There have been records of them being are kidnapped, of them being are harassed, of them being persecuted. Of our, But this is, this kind of... Our, Per anti-gay purge, and we're calling that purge. You know, we're not calling that. You know, something unique, something, and that's not a unique event anymore. Those were like spots. You know, we had this case. You know, we had one case in 2012. We had another case that was, you know, that was recorded in, you know, in 2007. And but, but what now, happened this year? It was like more than yeah, 100 became, people. Yeah, it became a massive kind of massive persecution based on sexual orientation. And that's where we're trying to attract attention to the fact that this is a crime against humanity because it's a massive, massive crime. A reminder that this is Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about the campaign for equal rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people in Russia. We're joined by Andrew Kramer of the New York Times Moscow Bureau, Tanya Lokshina with the Russian Office of Human Rights Watch, and a spokeswoman for the Russian LGBT network who asked not to be identified for security reasons. Now, if you're interested in more coverage of underreported international and human rights news, visit us at globaljournalist.org. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, or subscribe to the videocast of this program on YouTube. Andrew Kramer, I wanted to ask you, in your reporting, after you saw this initial report of this, what some people are calling a pogrom against gay men, you, you went to Chechnya to sort of interview people and find out like what how this was perceived on the ground there. What, what did you find? Well, I, I found that people in, in Chechnya were very reluctant to talk about um, uh, being gay and, and uh, homosexuality in general. And uh, I had to bring it up in a very delicate uh, way with people I've, I've met before, acquaintances of mine in, in Chechnya. Um, and just as an example, I interviewed the human rights uh, uh, ombudsman for uh, the region who um, works closely with the, the local government, but also is, has been a fairly respected figure in, in the human rights community. And uh, her her uh, manner of speaking about homosexuality and about gays was very out of step with um, what you you would expect to hear in the last um, ten or twenty years or or even longer in in, uh, in the West. Um, for example, she was saying that she had never in her her life met a, a gay person, and then would parenthetically add that she sees flies, mosquitoes, but but no gay men. And this is so, the ombudsman um, for human rights for the entire region, and she says she's never right. met a gay person in her life. And, and then, and then, is speaking about about them in in this derogatory manner. So, it, it was it was not really possible to find somebody who was sympathetic um, in in Chechnya. Though there were certainly there were people, a taxi driver might say this. Um, you know, I've heard about this roundup. It's it's a rumor here, um, and I, I don't agree. But I also don't agree that um, that Islam would would approve of of a gay lifestyle. So, that was the scene I, I got from um, from Grozny. It's also um, a more pleasant city on the surface than some people might expect. It's um, been years now since the war, the worst of the war um, wrapped up. And, and so there's a nightlife, coffee shops, um, restaurants and so forth, um, where uh, where gay men had, had lived and, and lived a very closeted life, but been able to 
um, to, to get by um, in, in Chechnya. So the real reporting, in fact, was done with the help of intermediaries um, uh, it, w working with the gay uh, men who had left the region and were living uh, in a, a safe location outside of Chechnya. Well, Tanya Lokshina, I wanted to ask you about where, like, where does this, what is driving this homophobia or these attacks? Why is this happening now? You know, we heard the spokesperson for the Russian LGBT network saying that there had been some other cases over the years, but this was, uh, we're talking about 100 people being round up, some of them detained for days, some of them being tortured with electric shocks. Uh, what, what's driving this? Well, on the one hand, I totally agree with the spokesperson for Russian LGBT network. This purge is unprecedented because it's massive, it's well organized, it's very different from individual incidents when gay people in Chechnya were attacked by well, homophobic individuals, were framed by police officials, had money extorted from them under threat of revealing their sexual identity to their families and so on and so forth. This is different. This is a proper purge, a real special operation targeting mm. gay people where so many of them were just rounded up, held in secret prisons and tortured. On the other hand, again, like I said, such cleansing operations against different groups of undesirables are not new for Ramzan Kadyrov, the head of Chechnya and his law enforcement and security officials. This past spring, it was about cleansing, quote unquote, Chechen society from gay people. Earlier than that, it was about cleansing Chechen society from, say, drug users or Salafi Muslims, or suspected sympathizers of jihadists, and so on and so forth. So Ramzan Kadyrov is pretty well known for his special cleansing operations, and um, this one was one of the most horrendous of them indeed. Now, why exactly did it happen? That's a very good question. I think that, in fact, by carrying out this vicious purge, Chechnya's leadership wanted to consolidate their base of support, because while in Chechnya, homophobia is extreme and rampant. And when carrying out this horrid purge, local authorities actually knew that they would find a lot of support in conservative Muslim Chechen society. And at the same time, it was just one of those big cleansing operations enabling them to explain yet again to the public in Chechnya that they are on top of it, they have all the power, they can do whatever they want, and they are, quote unquote, for traditional values, among other things. Well, Tanya, let me, so let me turn this to the spokesperson for the Russian LGBT network, because you raise a couple interesting points there. But what I wanted to ask as well uh, is how has this, how have things changed? So this this pogrom, if you will, took place uh, earlier this year uh, in the springtime, back in March, April, I believe it was. What has the reaction been from Moscow, uh, from the federal government, which nominally oversees Chechnya? Yeah, I mean, that is a complicated issue to talk about, uh, I mean, for various reasons. So we are... We had we've experienced at least three waves of our anti-gay persecution in Chechnya. The first started in our late December and then ended in February, early March. Then the second one started in late March and early ended in early spring. And then the next one, the la the latest one, started in our after the holy month of Ramadan ended, so at the end of June. And we're still not sure if it ended or not. So we received certain requests for help from people during that period of time. Our, but the reaction from the federal authorities have, has been our outstanding and sort of laughable. Our, they were completely lost in how to react to this because I think what we all realize that the the, the, the Ramzan Kadyrov is kind of out of control and are, they have no con, no real power over the Chechen government and over the Chechen Republic. And so they were so lost in the way of how they should address this. And the rhetoric went from, we don't know what to do. We have no authority over this and are, that the 
you know, the civil rights uh, groups and the media are liars and everything from we need to investigate into this more. And there have been certain investigative, pre-investigate, not even investigative efforts, pre-investigative efforts to figure out what is going on in Chechnya. And they were all false and there was no criminal case initiated yet. Even though we have evidence, and not only us, but other civil rights groups have evidence that at least four people were killed by either our law enforcement officials or the families. And, I mean, this this has been the reaction, and that's it's still going on. They are still kind of lost in how to address this, and they are still kind of lost in the sense of what kind of rhetoric they want to pursue. So it's not clear if they're going to conduct a thorough investigation and bring perpetrators to justice or if they're unable to do something or if they're unwilling to do something. It's like I think I'm right now personally are am in between if they are unwilling to or they are, you know, they can't. They just can't. Well, our time does grow short, I mean, but, yeah. but let me turn this to Andrew Kramer of the New York Times then. Where do you see this story moving over the next uh, months and years? We just heard the spokesperson for the Russian LGBT network saying it's not clear if this pogrom is over. Do you expect that this is something that international pressure will force to end eventually or that this might be something that continues for some time? Well, thank you for the question. I think um, I, I agree with Tanya that, that there's rampant um, homophobia in Chechnya, but I'm not sure that that's the only ingredient you need for something like this to happen. It's, it's a baseline um, that you have in society. You might have a certain amount of anti-Semitism or racism or, in this case, homophobia in society. But for a, a crime of this scale, it also takes an organizing mind behind it. It takes uh, um, uh, some central authority to do this in an organized way. And that's really what came out from talking to the actual victims who described how they were uh, lured in by the police through various ruses, and, and there was a, there was an, uh, a system of detaining them and torturing them um, to uh, then in turn find more gay men. So um, I, I, it was my sense, and, and I, my my colleagues might have a better idea um, that that aspect of it uh, stopped after a few months, and there may have been pressure put on the, the regional authorities from the from the uh, federal government because of the international outcry um, uh, over this incident. Um, I think that as long as those authorities remain in Chechnya, there's, there's a risk that this would uh, repeat. Um, um, and, and nobody can say that it wouldn't um, until I, I'm sorry, Andrew, we're, we're just out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Pasha Zalutsky, Andrew Kramer, Tanya Lokshina, and the Russian LGBT Network for joining us. Now, if you're interested in more coverage of underreported international and human rights news, visit us at globaljournalist.org. You can also connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, or subscribe to the videocast of this program on YouTube. Our producers this week are Rachel Foster Gimbel and Edom Kasaye. Pat Akers is our audio engineer and Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.